Does saying thee and thou in our prayers keep us at a distance from God? Next on the Ex-Mormon Files. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Ex-Mormon Files. I'm your host, Bishop Earl, and I appreciate you spending some time with us. Today we have Martha Bybee, who's been willing to come and share her story. And it's so fascinating because there's some aspects here that we don't usually run into. <laughs> you were actually raised Catholic, is that right? Till I was 14. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. uh, and did you attend church? And was your family active? Yes, I went to Catholic school, went to catechism as a little girl, and uh, pretty active Catholic up yeah. until 14, and then wow. that's when we joined the LDS church. Oh, you were converts. Mm -hmm. The whole family converted? Yep. And where was this at? Where were you born? And um, We were living in Southern California um, from the time I was four till I was 14, and the missionaries um, visited us there, taught us for a while, and then because we were going to Catholic school, my, my mother had them stop. But um, then a year later, we moved to Utah because we had been on vacation, loved it, oh. and then was when we joined the church was a, yeah. the next year. What was intriguing about the church, as you recall, at 14? Um we just liked the culture we liked what it did for people that it you know made decent families and that was oh. the whole reason my parents wanted to move to utah they had oh. come on vacation and <laughs> saw the atmosphere was something that they liked for their kids they were able to move here and mm -hmm. raise their kids and so uh, were they particularly active then after that um when we first joined the church my whole family was very active for a few years um but then gradually stopped my dad lost interest right up front. I don't think he's ever been very um, spiritually inclined. Mm. I think he joined it, joined it more because of what he felt socially it did for the family. Yeah. Um, I was the last one still attending when I was 17, um, kind of going on my own. And oh. then eventually I stopped you going as well. You went to Young well. Women's and yeah. that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Mm -hmm. Did you ever take seminary? I did. I took did seminary you? most of my high school. Oh, did you? Mm -hmm. And then you say at 17 something 17, I kind of stopped going with my family because my family had stopped kind of gradually yeah. all tapered off before yeah. that. And so I, I was not going by the time I was a senior. You considered yourself active, though, I mean, or a member of the church, of mm -hmm. course. And mm -hmm. I was just not active Feel like at you the had time. a testimony? I felt like Chosen I did Smith off and, and on. Um, definitely strong testimony later in my life. Sure. Very much. Always, always bore that testimony. Yeah, tell us about that. You At 17, you kind of fall away, but at age, mm -hmm. what, 24, 25? Um, 17, I leave my whole family, and by the time I was 19, my family said, you know, we shouldn't not have a religion, we should go back to being Catholic. So my mom and dad oh, went really? to the Catholic bishop, <laughs> Okay. I mean the Catholic uh, priest, and he said, well, if you want to be Catholic again, you need to take your membership out. So we did petition the ward to have our our membership removed from the LDS church, oh, and we all went back to being Catholic. And I tried that for a year, but I kind of, Felt like there was nothing there, so I, I left after a year. And I always, in the back of my mind, said, you know, I'm going to go back to being LDS one day. That just kind of felt right. Yeah. But I stayed uh, away until I was 25. Um, I was working in California with a roommate who was LDS when I was 25 and started going back to church with her, and I was rebaptized. But then immediately, I don't know what it was, but um, something just didn't feel right. I don't know if I wanted to fit in with my family or what it was, but I went inactive. But always in the back of my mind, I'm going to go back. Um, get. And I got married that year, and uh, in the temple. Not that, not right oh, away. Not I right married away. my my husband civilly at first, but my whole because he had been inactive, oh. but he was raised LDS, and my whole goal was to get him to the temple. <laughs> so within four years, we were we were sealed in the temple, and from that day on, we were hundred percent strong. And where, which temple was that? Um, we got sealed in the Salt Lake Temple. I took oh. out my endowments at South Jordan. Okay. And they were so very active after that. Very so. active. Always held a temple recommend. Oh, you know, always served my callings faithfully. Yeah. And, gospel doctrine you know, teacher, huh? Gospel doctrine teacher for three years. Wow. And that was that was my favorite calling. I really enjoyed it. I always yeah. liked the meaty, meaty things. I enjoyed things. that too. You I could really the, dig in. And, I love and the meat of, of the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. Looking back now, just because you've mentioned that, do you sense that you really were teaching meat? <laughs> I thought I was. Yeah, I mean, when, 
What's funny is now I look back at it, and I, you know, I, I'd say that I felt like I had like a, a master's degree in, in Mormon gospel, but sure. then as I became a Christian, I felt like a baby. I, know. I felt like a baby. I had to learn everything from scratch, and it's been a wonder learning <laughs> now, and I love learning. As a Christian, it, mm -hmm. it is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, going back, though, and, and being active and all that, you spent time in the temple, and you mentioned to me earlier that you'd gone like every week. Uh, yeah, towards the end of my membership, I was going sometimes twice a week, you know, and really? I'm, I'm single, so I was going by myself. So that was taking some dedication. I wasn't going on a date. I was going by myself to the wow, temple. Wow, that's amazing. And, you know, we often ask uh, people that go in for the first time how they feel about the temple. But maybe maybe from your perspective, being a very active temple goer as a, as a mature person, what, uh, what did the temple really mean to you as you went through? You knew you were going through for someone else after, mm -hmm. of course, after the first time. Mm -hmm. Um, Any thoughts about... I remember thinking that if there was anything weird in there, um, that this is God's work, so nothing would be, everything would be okay because it's God's work. And that's kind of how I kinda. Um, made everything seem okay to me. Anything um, that was strange. You anything just that was strange, was... I just kind of went, this is God's work. I don't understand it, yeah. but I'll work really hard to try to understand it. And I did. I was there and always tried to get something out of it. Yeah. Um, there were some th sometimes that some things, uh, <laughs> I don't know what I should say or not say, but um, yeah, I remember feeling like if I was being fooled, there was one, you know, at the one part in the really? ceremony where I felt like um, if I was being taught the philosophies of men mingled with scripture, and that's what was really going on. You really thought that? I thought that, and I remember. I've certainly thought that since. No, I, I remember sitting in the, the temple, temple going, wouldn't that be weird if that's really what was going on. Wow. And and then I would say, oh, of course not. That's not what's really going on. The message <laughs> well, is this. This is God's work. This is huh? God's work, yeah, yeah, of course. But I, it, it did cross my mind a few times. Now, having left, you probably know all, so much more about temples and mm -hmm. Israel's temples mm -hmm. and, and the masonry. Do you know much about mm -hmm. that? You've read about that? I always know, knew that um, the basis of the temple ceremony was Masonic oh, uh, rituals. Uh -huh. I'd always known that. But, you know, as my ex-husband had told me, well, Joseph Smith was a Mason, and he just kind of, God, that's how God introduced this to him and brought it to us so that we would know, because that's what they used to do in the uh, temples in the biblical times, and yeah. that's how Joseph learned. And I went, oh, okay, you know, kind of bought that. We do kind of buy that. Don't we? <laughs> we buy all kinds of things. You buy, you, yeah. You did have a few uh, interesting things that you, you told me earlier about uh, things that were on the shelf. And I introduced you today with the thee and thou part of mm -hmm. our prayers that we say that. Let's talk a little bit about that relationship with God. And mm -hmm. That was something that I would say always bothered me. And especially like we'd be reminded of it from time to time from the pulpit. Oh, by the way, you're not supposed to be saying you and your, you're supposed to be saying thee and thou. And I would, it would trouble me and I would in, in my little smart alecky way of thinking I would say well what do they tell the people in Taiwan to say because they don't have old English what do they tell the people in France to say you know if they have a formal aspect have, to their exactly. language or and something. I thought well how do they do that <clears throat> and uh, so that always bothered me and I did feel like it kept me away from away from or kept God at a distance yeah. or kept him um, not personal in my life. Well, the reason I thought it was interesting is because I, I use the thee and thou religiously mm -hmm. as a, as a LDS. I did as well. But I, I didn't notice it as a problem until I left and started using you mm -hmm. and, and kind of referring to Father and, and more uh, Jesus. And mm -hmm. We've talked about that too, using mm -hmm. the name Jesus. Uh, makes it much more personal, much more of a mm -hmm. personal relationship, do you think? Oh, it opened the door. I, I was almost uncomfortable. I would say I was uncomfortable saying Jesus because we always, as Latter-day Saints, you would always say the Savior or you always refer to him by his titles but right. never just say Jesus. And you don't, definitely don't uh, direct him uh, when you're communicating with him by using his name. You just never did. No. And so as I started being around Christians who use the name Jesus, I remember being uncomfortable with that. <laughs> but then as I became comfortable with it, I felt closer and closer to him. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it felt like a tool 
um, that the LDS Church uses to keep you at a distance from Isn't that from having a personal I, relationship. My experience is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. You had some other few things that were. Uh, you've got a list here of things that were kind of things on the shelf. Uh, any that you remember? The cross, for example. Or? Um. Yeah. The cross. Well, because I had a Catholic uh, background. I remember that I didn't have the strong aversion to the cross this, that most Latter-day Saints have. I mean, obviously, I didn't I, I didn't wear a cross or or um, reverence it the way that other Christians do while I was Mormon. But um, I always felt like it was silly the way they had an aversion to the cross. I mean, I understood the reasoning I was given, but right. it it bothered me because I always thought the cross meant something beautiful to Christians, and. Um, as I have become a Christian, I now have a strong feeling that uh, the LDS Church keeps you from the cross and from understanding grace. Because if once you have those two, you don't need them. <laughs> you 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 have a direct Such relationship a good with God. Point. Yeah. And and it's per to me it's purposeful that they keep you from the cross. So, well, so we've mentioned at least two things that keep us at a distance mm -hmm. from from God and. And I don't know whether that's a, I hate to even use the word cultic uh, process that they have mm -hmm. over us or whatever it is, but they have answers to all the questions. Mm -hmm. We accept them and we just keep moving on blindly, don't mm -hmm. we, and don't really think about things. Mm -hmm. Well, so actually, actually uh, after you were active then in the, back in the church, and uh, what happens after that? Do you I things that... I was um, dyed in the wool, true believing, strong Mormon for about 30 years. I have, wow. you know, we got sealed to the temple, had our family, um, adopted two girls through LDS Family Services, okay. had them sealed to us, and uh, always, you know, attended regularly. And, you know, even if I had to drag <laughs> my ex husband, <laughs> I was gung ho and uh, always, you know, held my callings faithfully, never yeah. touched coffee or anything like that. And well, always had that temple recommended. Always had, yeah, oh, yeah, did that. And it was very, very important to me. And it was very important that my kids um, follow in that path as well. Um, but then, yeah, so um, what happens? Kinda? Well, I got divorced. Okay. And, um, you know, went through a few years of, of, but I was still very active as a divorced woman, only dated LDS men, and uh, was very picky about that. And, then after a few years, I thought, you know what? <laughs> it's, it's really funny to say. I think I was running into a lot of Mr. Magoo's looking for Barbie. <laughs> and so I felt that was predominant in the LDS. That's an interesting singles. way to say it's it. It's true. Yeah. So I thought, well, I need to broaden that. Maybe my my true person I'm supposed to be with isn't LDS right now. So I opened I it up. I make to, him LDS. Oh, yeah, yeah. I thought I would convert him. Yeah. So I met somebody who was um, a Christian. And we dated with the intention of neither of us. We told each other neither of us were going to try to convert the other. And uh, of course, in the back of my mind, I'm going to, I'm going to get him to be held. Yes, okay. but um, I uh, was starting to get a little bit bored with church, and and you know, it just wasn't fulfilling me. And and so what I figured I would do is just go to the temple more. And this is why I was going to the temple twice a week towards oh. the end. Because it just wasn't feeling it. Trying to feel like fill the gap. Or trying something. to fill it, and uh, and I wasn't filling that gap. And um, I had a I remember the last sacrament meeting I attended was just another boring meeting about how to prepare for listening to general conference. Oh really? <laughs> yeah. And then somebody in Relief Society said something about having a relative that um, was dating a general authority, um, and she was given this rule book, so to speak, and said, you'll never wear jeans the rest of your life. And I remember thinking, okay, really? that's kind of the last straw. And uh, just coincidentally, I planned to go to church with my boyfriend, my then boyfriend, um, the following Sunday. So we went to church and that was the first time I ever experienced worship music like that. Yeah. What did you think? Of and that? oh, I was so moved. Were you really? I was so moved. Um, Tears, you know, but I'm, I tear anyway very easily, but it, it was very moving. And my, my daughter went with us, the, the, my 16-year-old daughter, and we got back out to the car after the service, and she said, why can't we sing like that in our church? <laughs> and I just said, I don't know. But I just had this week of, I've got to sort something out. So the next week was conference. I felt like this week of turmoil. I've got to sort some things out. And that was when I 
first started to consider all the things that I had put on the shelf or ignored, all those things that, you know, were controversial that I would never give attention to because I was very faithful. And they said, if anything ever bothers you, you know, try, doubt your doubts, as, yeah. as uh, President Uchtdorf said. I was very good about doubting my doubts and just putting that stuff away. This but I your... began to um, consider those things. It's very traumatic, isn't it? It was very traumatic. It felt like it felt like a death in the family. Really? It felt like a death, and I felt like I went through a period of probably about three months, where it was almost um, a detox. I would say it was a detox time, and then after about three months, it was nothing but joy. Really? Mm -hmm. But you start considering things that, like you said, you'd never even entertain those notions before. Mm -hmm. You either put them on a shelf or just. Close Don't let myself look and, at them. Yeah. yeah, I wouldn't. I was very faithful about not letting myself look at those things. Yeah. But then I started to do my homework, and I primarily went to LDS sources like um, the what do they call them? The um, um, not the essays. The essays. The, yes. Oh, the, the essays. essays yeah. Yes, I started going and reading the essays, and you know, to address this issue or to address that issue. And every time I read the essays, I thought, that's no answer. No. <laughs> it would always end up, we well, just got to have faith. And I'm like, mm, yeah, but there needs to be truth as well. Yeah. And the truth is always, it, it tends to be self-evident. Yeah. And there was just too much that I would have to just take on faith. And I just went, you know what? It's not there. Interesting. But, um, yeah. And so did you keep going then to the Christian church? Just... Um, yeah, I've gone every, yeah, I went faithfully. I mean, after the general conference that mm -hmm. time. Yeah, general conference. Quit, quit I listened going. to gen general conference with the intention of, I've got to sort this out and make sense of things. Yeah. And so um, I listened to it, and it was interesting because when I listened to General Conference that time, the thought occurred to me is, this is how conference must sound to the rest of the world. Because it, it wasn't there. It just, <laughs> I, I, it seemed foolish. Listening to it other than with Mormon ears, with you Mormon were listening ears. with kind of open I listened to Christian it. ears. Yeah, and, and it yeah. just, it didn't hold anything. For me, and I went okay. I'm done. Not particularly worshipful, is it? Mm -mm, it wasn't so. worshipful, and um, it, I started to pay attention to the fact that, you know, Jesus was rarely mentioned. Yeah. And you know, I've come to the conclusion that he's not more than a tool to the church, and uh, that just kind of uh, that bothers me. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I I felt that in the temple too, so it was just kind of interesting mm -hmm. that you you sense that. Was there any particular thing that you'd recommend people to go to or read or um, anything that I just helped went, you a lot? I just went online, watched a lot of videos, and started considering things. Um, you know, there were always issues. I would, I would say go read the essays because they address yeah. the controversial issues, and I don't think they address them very effectively. If well, I always am impressed with what they don't say, you mm -hmm. know, it seems like. And Mm -hmm. it, if we have now, I always thought General Conference really catered to new m members. I guess I always felt like the f the reason it's so boring or bland, and there's really not any deep doctrine taught, is mm -hmm. because they're trying to appeal to the new members. You know, I just had this vision of millions of people joining the church all the time, mm -hmm. and of course I knew the numbers, but th just that this was their way of introducing them to the basic gospel. Mm -hmm. You know, and I kind of th sense that's why. At least that was my rationale for why it was so, <laughs> it lacked very much depth at mm -hmm. all. So, yeah. Yeah, it, I always felt like it was the same thing over and over and over. But then they'd tell you, well, we give you the same thing over and over and over because you just need to reinforce the basic truths. Right. And I was like, okay. You know, like when I was teaching gospel doctrine, it's pretty much the same thing over and over. Yeah. But, um, so I guess Jesus has taken on a little different perspective these days. Yeah. I, yeah. I love that I can say his name now, yeah. and I love that when I'm talking to him, sometimes I talk to him like a friend, that I, can, I just say, Any I love you. Any time during the day, of yeah. course, yeah. I love you. I never just said, I love you, <laughs> when I was talking to my God before. Yeah. And I do a lot, and I'm very grateful, and I'm very happy. I, I'm always expressing how grateful I am to feel rescued, because I do... That's the best way I can describe this transition that I feel like I've been rescued. Well, that's neat. And you mentioned earlier about the cross and mm -hmm. and uh, grace. Did we? Did you even understand that as a Mormon? No. And that's where I feel like I've been given the greatest gift because yeah. 
I mean, I didn't understand what the cross really meant, what grace really meant, and how it applied in my life. You just felt, we just felt like we had to work our way, right? I had to work my way, and so much was my responsibility. In fact, everything felt like, my, my whole life feels different now, because I don't look at my whole life as everything I do, I have to figure it out. It's my responsibility. <laughs> now I literally can feel like God's, God has me. Yeah. He, he holds me, and He has me, and... I don't stress as much. It's It's been the most freeing thing I've ever experienced. I, I, I know exactly what you mean, the peace and the freedom, uh -huh. the joy of of having that confidence in what Jesus did for us mm -hmm. that we couldn't do for ourselves. And here we are as Mormons for years. You're 30 years or maybe more. It was with, about 35 almost yeah, total. Just on that little treadmill, mm -hmm. teaching and going to the temple and doing all the things you're supposed yeah. to. And yeah. I will go, I will do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And we just, uh, you know, I don't know, unless you've been through that, I don't think people really realize the freedom and joy that, that comes for that. And and just going to church is, is a joy, mm -hmm. where for me it used to be almost any reason I could. Mm -hmm. This isn't quite true, because I, I did go to church regularly, but... Um, mm -hmm. You know, if I if went on a vacation and I could could come home on Saturday, and but it extended mm -hmm. into Sunday, it wasn't that big of a deal, mm -hmm. you know. And and now I just love going and and worshiping and yeah. And it is so worshipful. Isn't it, it is, I mean, and it's a totally different experience. I thought it was really funny uh, around Easter time. My daughter said to me, "Oh, I just wish we could go to church more than once a week." <laughs> and I says, "Well, guess what? There's Good Friday services, so we get to go twice this week." She was like, "Yay!" I mean, she loves church. Oh, that's I amazing. love going to church. It's not it's not a, a, a drudgery at all anymore. It's joyful. Yeah. And and you know, I don't want to feel like I overuse the term joy, but I can't think of a better, a better word, word to yeah. describe my um, my whole feeling now. It's joy is the only word that works. I don't know if it's appropriate to ask you this because we didn't talk about it before. But your family has that been? The, the kids? Um, my daughter, uh, my youngest daughter, who, who lives with, with me full time, um, she, in fact, she kind of let out. She was the one that who, was the first person who said, we need to take our membership off the rolls. Well, she was sure asking some other good questions, wasn't she? She was. Yeah. And so she was very, you know, she's been gung-ho from day one. She, oh. she took to Christianity without reservation. My other daughter, only recently um, said yes to Jesus, and she's still working through things in her life, but sure. she's she's got Starting that connection with him. Okay. She has that connection, and she's always told me that she believes in God. She uh, left the LDS church before the rest of us, and I remember I was appalled, but um, oh. she just went inactive, but she said she still believed in God, and, and you know, only recently at church did she... Um, <laughs> raise her hand and came out with a little white Bible and oh, <laughs> surprised right. me. But I was, I was. Really Isn't happy. that interesting how we judge other people though? Mm. Oh, I totally they, did. Yeah, when they leave the church or they're not as active as they're supposed to be and not doing what they're. And as an LDS mother, it's a a very stressful thing because you want to be coercive with your kids to make sure that they're on track, to right. make sure they're doing everything and checking off the list. And oh my goodness, what if they fail here? What if they fail there? I don't have any more. Now I just, I love them and I know that God's got them. Well, as an old gospel doctrine teacher, <laughs> what do you think about the Bible now? Any differences there? Um, I love being able to uh, learn because I don't feel like I was ever really learning before because I was always doing everything through the window of the Book of Mormon. Yeah. You know, everything was always... Yeah, the Bible is just so cherry-picked or something, mm -hmm. isn't it? Before... And now I read it and I thought, oh, wow, I never got that before. Yeah. So I, I like learning new things. And like I say, I feel like a baby in, yeah. in Christianity now. Even though we spent all that time in religion, mm -hmm. we really didn't and understand the Bible. And I thought I knew the Bible. Bible. Yeah. I really did. But I'd read it a few times mm -hmm. and thought I had a pretty good understanding. But I, I can't believe it's, in, it's there. I just didn't, didn't never see it. Because you were seeing it with the LDS filter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh. It's, uh, it's just a fascinating story. Um, well, yeah, you, a couple of other little things that you had as, as uh, things on a shelf that I thought were interesting. The White and Delight, some out of the Book of Mormon. <laughs> that one bothered me since I was a kid because I, I was going to seminary. And, you know, I'm Hispanic and my mom has a dark complexion. Yeah. And I remember thinking, well, does that mean my mom's skin's going to get 
white, <laughs> you know? And I thought, well, I know that's not going to happen. But my mom was like one of the best ladies I've ever known. So <laughs> that kind of bothered me when I was about 16 years old. I remember that. And that was one that I, very first times I consciously remember putting something away and going, oh, I'm just not going to deal with that right now. Now, you know they changed it. Oh, I know. Some of them, at least, to pure and, and delightsome. Yeah, they changed the wording to pure and delightsome, but it was there. And it that's the thing. Why. That's another thing that has bothered me is like whenever things uh, were expedient, you know, politically or culturally, oh, that like those things the, get changed. The priesthood and mm -hmm, all that. With priesthood. The, all those things kind of get changed um, to fit cultural to fit, yeah. norms. Which, when God's an unchanging God, that does make a difference, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Oh, gosh. Well, we're just about out of time. Anything you want to say to your family or friends? Um, I know this is a t it's always tough to come out. And how long has it been for you? About a year, almost a year, because it was right year. before fall conference. Wow. It was right before fall conference. Um, yeah, the week before fall conference. Change anything? Are you... Would I change anything? Well, I just mean it's been worth it. Oh, I guess is what yeah, I mean. it's so worth it. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the thing, is I've had people tell me so many times that they are sorrowful for me, that they're <laughs> uh, heart sick, and it's funny because I, I say, I'm joyful, I'm happy, don't be heart sick for me, and yeah. sometimes when I see an LDS person and I see can see their garment lines, I'm like, oh, I'm so sad for them, they need to be rescued too. <laughs> yeah, they need to be rescued and feel mm -hmm. like they're in the hands and of feel, God. And know what that feels like, to feel confidence. like you're in God's hands. Yeah, and yeah. He loves us. And and the, that he literally has us. So I kind of interrupted you, I guess. Anything you want to say to anybody? I, th I think that's that's what I would want to say is that don't don't feel sorry for me. Feel I wish you could understand the joy that I have. Yeah. Well, Martha, thank you so much. And it's such a joyful journey, as we've said so many times. But uh, <laughs> it, it is. It's just uh, you just have that sense of, of uh, gratitude and mm -hmm. appreciation for the Bible and for Jesus and mm -hmm. what he did. So, thank you very much and I appreciate it. And mm -hmm. We'll see you next time on the Ex-Mormon Files. Mm -hmm.